The gentleman sat next to me, Sir Robin Saxby, was the first CEO of Arm in 1991. So he has had a massive, massive impact on the way we communicate, particularly as 250 billion of these microprocessors that can be found in smartphones, in tablets, in laptops, etc., have been sold or manufactured by Arm in Cambridge, um, thanks to, to Sir Robin Saxby. So I'm going to pass him over and he's going to take the hot seat. And you will have an opportunity to ask questions, although I do have two peers from Little Thurrock Primary School that are here with me that will also be asking Sir Robin some questions. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, it's lovely to be online with you, but just to remind you, when we started on, we couldn't do online. The Internet came a bit after we started the company. So looking at myself, uh, what I would say to you, particularly as school kids, um, I followed my passion all my life. So I was given a, a, an electronics kit at the age of eight, bells, buzzers. I'm going to show you some pictures in a minute. And that's when I got really interested in electricity and circuits. I had a TV repair business at the age of 13. My dad would find customers in the pub with broken televisions and I'd repair them. And back in those days, the, the televisions were black and white. And my biggest earner was replacing a cathode ray tube uh, to make money. My first job uh, was in color television design. I actually was involved with a team of engineers designing the, the first color television in the UK. It was called Rankbush Murphy. Um, I was hired into Motorola Semiconductors in 1973. That was a big, expanding uh, American company. And they taught me a lot about sales and marketing as opposed to just engineering. I was involved with a startup called ES2, European Silicon Structures, making using advanced technology e-beam machines. The bad news is the e-beam machine didn't work properly and uh, the business model was basically broken. So having had a, a failed startup to start with, um, the next one was going to be better. So I was the founding CEO of Arm with just 12 engineers and me. So now, the origin of the Arm architecture, you can do lots of searches on the web. Originally, Arm was the Acorn wrist machine. It was a chip that was designed within Acorn. And uh, we turned it into Arm. And with only 1.75 million pounds of cash, and this team of 12 engineers, we created the, the world's most prolific global standard uh, for digital microprocessors. And you've seen from the earlier headlines that was uh, 250 billion ARM chips have been shipped. But what I should explain, the key to the business model of ARM was we would never build chips. I said we, we'll build chips over my dead body. And the good news is I'm still alive and ARM doesn't make chips. So what ARM does, it, it, the way to think of this is we license digital engine blueprints that everybody puts into their own chips, whether that's Apple, Acorn, VLSI technology, Sharp, etc. So and the good news is the business model was different. We said we will not manufacture, we will license and we get a royalty on every chip. And the good news is that everything I said would happen in the first ARM brochure has actually happened, but it's actually been much, much bigger than I expected because of the creation of the Internet and the demand for mobile communication. So that's the good news. Uh, I've now got to drive this computer, which is the button I push to make the slide go forwards. Thank you. Right. So what I've done, because I'm dealing with younger people, uh, what I thought I'd do is just give you a flavour of my lifetime and possibly in the age where where you are now. So there you see on the top left a picture of myself with my mum and dad, me as a baby in 1947. And you can probably tell my dad was a keen gardener, actually had a lovely garden. There I am with my younger brother and a next door neighbour. I was born in Chesterfield, Derbyshire. The next picture you'll see on the left, it's me as a rabbit and it's a school play and the teacher was called Miss Frackingham. And basically around that time, you see me at the side, I was given an electrical kit, an electrical outfit. And there's a picture of that electrical outfit. And it talks about electricity. It talks about bells, buses, uh, buzzers and so on. And what I would do is wire up circuits in the classroom. So Miss Frackingham, our teacher, said, we'll have an, opera, an optional lesson. Bring in whatever you want to do. I brought in my kit and I built circuits. And I remember the teacher saying to me, 
be careful you don't get electrocuted. And I said, don't worry, it's only four and a half volts. So that's really what started my interest in this subject. Many of you will be building circuits and playing with things in your classrooms. And if you enjoy doing that, I'd say keep doing it. The other thing I want to say, though, is you don't have to do this subject. My basic view is that within every child or person there are some passions and if you can ignite your passions and what you're really interested in you'll have a better chance the next thing that happened you see that that's a book called the model manual of modern radio it was written by a guy called john scott taggart this was the early days of radio and i inherited this book from a next door neighbor who died his name was mr birch and he invented these valves and I started building circuits, amplifiers for music, uh, transmitters and so on. And that was about the age of 11. The next thing is all of us as, as, as kids or adults, for that matter, we have successes and failures. And the, the, the thing, the picture there on the right, you'll see this is my first success. I'm 13 years old. There's a competition in my town for all of the kids it's about road safety, for all of the kids on cycles to ride around the town and we'll be monitored and watched by lorry drivers, etc., to see who is the safest child on the roads of Chesterfield. And that happened to be me. And there I am being presented with a brownie box camera. By the way, it's a bit different from your mobile phone. This was chemical film and so on. That was my present for my prize at the age of 13. The next thing on the right, my favourite subjects at school were maths, physics and chemistry. So I was in the science six for my later studies in life. But again, my school was very diverse in Chesterfield and they said, we've got an idea for somebody in the science six to do a painting to win a prize. And I'd had no training in painting, but I was given some paints by an, another next door neighbor and I learned how to paint with using oil. And I did that painting and I won the prize. Now, the good news about that, that's turned into a latter day ho hobby. So now whenever I go on holiday, I do a painting to remember where I've been. Now, I wanted to go to university and I chose Liverpool University. The reason why I chose Liverpool University, as well as it had a good electronics department, that's the subject I wanted to study, was because I love music and Liverpool was seen in the world as the capital of rock and roll because that's where the Beatles came from. And on the left, you'll see me in the middle with two new friends in my university uh, room, which actually, again, for me, coming from a, an ordinary house, we didn't have central heating, but my university room had uh, central heating. Also, I was attracted to Liverpool because that's the electronics department, which was a brand new building in the year I joined, 1965. And the other good news, you'll see uh, my wife is actually with me at this school at the moment. There is a, a, a picture of myself and my wife, Patty. She was Patty Bell in those days. And there we are at a formal dance in Liverpool in 1966. The good news is we're still together. And what I'd say, all of us need help. And I'm very grateful to Patty's help. Also, by the way, for your information, Patty used to be a teacher. Now, within life, if we're too narrowly focused, it's not necessarily good. So also, whilst I was at university, I was president of the Hall of Residence. And what we used to do at the Hall of Residence was put on dances and entertainment and make money from those things. They used to be as president of Hall. Also, as president of Hall, in the rag week, you'll see that I am actually the person in white who is the engine driver of this. This engine was called the Roscoe Emperor. You can see, again, a bit of engineering in there as well. That's how it was built. And because I was the president, I didn't have to pull the engine. I got driven around by the others pulling it. I got my degree in 1968. And again, I'd encourage all of you to work hard and pass your degree. To be successful in life, I think you need to work hard. And if you can, follow your passions if you can find out what your passions are. Some of us, by the way, takes us longer to find out what our passions are. And then latterly, there you see me getting, because of my success in life, there with Liverpool, I'm getting my honorary doctorate in about the year 2000, 2001. And I'm still very involved with the University of Liverpool. I'm actually a visiting professor. So I've retired from my full time job that used to pay me money. I retired from ARM in 2007. And in my inverted commas retirement, I talk to people like you. I give lectures. I'm involved with some startups. I'm involved with some charities, et cetera, et cetera. And it's lovely. It was lovely here to have met uh, all the young people who asked me some good questions. So after at Liverpool, 
so you remember I had my radio and TV repair business. So there's some thinking about what you would you like to do for your career? So for my final year essay, I wrote uh, it, my final year essay was color television receiver design theory and practice. And basically this color was just starting. My first job, I worked for Rankbush Murphy in Chiswick. You see the third from the left at the top is the television that my circuits went into. That's a picture of the circuit diagram. And the thing on the left is what I designed. And you may see there are two sort of oblong shaped things, uh, one sort of middle uh, top ish left and the other one absolute middle uh, bottom. They're two microchips. Those microchips in those days only contained 50 transistors. Today's microchips contain up to 50 billion transistors. So how the world has changed, I could personally design on my own those individual chips. But today's chips create, there are teams and teams of people collaborating because the world has become more complicated. And because the world has become more complicated, that makes your amazing mobile phones work with all of them in. The other thing is I got married. There's the getaway car from the marriage. And th we happen to be in Essex at the moment. And that is our first rented accommodation when we are new, newly married just down the road from here. The other thing about life, uh, my wife's always loved cats. That's our first cat, Bruce. Now, another thing, again, I'd say this to again, I've got some children here who are less shy than others. One of the things I did, I gave a talk at the Royal Television Society when I was about 23 years old called TV and Chips. And basically, as a result of that talk, Motorola offered me a job with a company car. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. There, there are Patty and I getting married uh, in Altrincham, Cheshire. That's another picture of me in a laboratory back in the 60s. Right. So Motorola. Now, we all need money but we don't need too much money. And how Motorola got me, they get, they offered me that wonderful car, which is a Ford Cortina 2000 GXL. And as a young engineer with a broken Ford Angler, this was very attractive. And what we did at Motorola, we sold microchips to all of the people like television companies, computer companies, etc. And this is how I got my career in sales and marketing. Uh, again, we've got another cat in the middle there with my wife, Patty. And on the right, you'll see me. There I am. This is with actually a company called Video Master, who actually had an amazing game called Star Chess. And this was the chip that went into games. With my career with Motorola, I had 11 years with uh, Motorola. And one day somebody offered me a job to be the chief executive of a company called Henderson Security Systems. And this was involved in using technology to control access control and various security products and so on. So that was my first CEO's role. In reality, that was a role that didn't fit with me because the company was more about making money and tightly managing people than being creative and innovative. But Doing that job, I learned more about manufacturing, more about finance, etc. And there you'll see me off Long Island because the company Continental Instrument Corporation on the left were based in Long Island. And to relax, I'd go and have a swim. That's actually off Long Island. So another thing I'd say to all of you in this highly pressured world that we live in today, which is even, I think, more pressured with online media and so on, I encourage all of you to try and find some relaxed time and space time. One of the things I do a lot today is ski. Uh, I also go to football matches. I'm a Liverpool supporter. Should any of you be a Liverpool supporter? We have season tickets. That's because I met my wife there and I had to become a Red for my wife to marry me. So that, that worked well. Then the next thing that happened is I joined a company called European Silicon Structures. That's a picture of a wafer. That's the opening of the building. And the idea of European stru Structures, Silicon Structures, was to use e-beam technology to make amazing chips. The bad news is the e-beam technology wasn't as good as it was supposed to be, so it didn't quite work out. Then we started on. That's a picture of the arm barn. That's one of the first meetings. We started again. You probably know Apple started in a garage. Well, Arm started in a barn, and that's just outside of Swaff and Baldick. And then this is the journey of Arm. Top left, that's the first chip we produced that was used in the Apple Newton. Uh, that was back in 1991. The other thing is to be a global standard. I said we're going to be a global standard. You have to travel a lot. So I was typically in Asia and uh 
America every month of my working life, Europe as well. And so I would spend a lot of time in BA economy traveling around the world. The engineers calculated what my average speed was in a particular year. The other thing about business and universities. So universities are very good at pure research and collaboration between universities and business is useful. But you see me with Steve Ferber, who was professor of computer science at Manchester, and we won the prize for the best industry collaboration with universities. And then there are other pictures around here about being a global standard. We have Koreans in the picture, we have Americans in the picture, Japanese in the picture. Engineering, is about global collaboration to create a better solution to help the whole of humanity. And I'm very, very fortunate to have lots of friends all over the world in all the different countries. The big advantage of that is I can pick up the phone to find out what's really happening in those companies, as opposed to reading what is in the newspaper headlines, which is usually not very accurate. I mentioned earlier about my skiing hobby. And again, a lot of people in electronics and electronic engineering uh, like skiing. So again, as well as doing business together, we would relax together up mountains. Now, the good news is Arm went public. So when you've, when you've created a private company and you're a startup, when the company goes public, you are floating on the stock market. And that creates a lot of wealth and people can buy and sell shares in your business. So there's a picture of me as and the finance director of the t uh, at that time, Jonathan Brooks, getting uh, as we list on the London Stock Exchange. And then after all of this wonderful success, Eventually, you get recognized in life, especially as an engineer, you spend years and years working like crazy. Nobody notices you. And then suddenly, after a long time, uh, somebody notices you and says thank you. So I was given a knighthood by Charles. He was the uh, Prince of Wales then, but he's now the king. He knighted me uh, back in uh, 2001. And again, by the way, if you just put my name into the Internet, there's lots of stuff out there. And the joke about this is that sharp is really sharp. And when you go in to get your reward as a, a knight, you talk about how to bend down, how to put your knee down and how to make sure he doesn't uh, chop your head off. So the good news is in retirement, I'm doing lots of stuff. Everything's great and even more fun, more painting, more music. And I hope all of you. I know you have to work at school and that's important and you need to pass things, you need to do things. But I think if you can have a bit of fun, too, um, you'll have a better life.